Hey everyone, I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone. On today's episode, I chat with Regina Way, who wrote the chapter on Asian and Pacific Islander clients for the All Together Us book. Regina is an IFS Level 1 trained couples and family therapist in Washington State who specializes in sex therapy. Her work centers folks who identify as BIPOC and or LGBTQIA+, and focuses on helping clients heal racial, intergenerational, sexual, and other traumas. Regina has an MA in Couples and Family Therapy and an MA in Modern Chinese Literature and Culture. She has written a novel, which we talk about, set in China, that deals with the themes of trauma, healing, and cross-cultural connections, and misses. You can find her at Regina Wei, that's W-E-I, dot com. We talk about all the things. We talk about her novel, which I think is, sounds fascinating, collectivism, authority, holding space for tension and all kinds of areas, racialized bodies, intergenerational and historical trauma, heritage as a protective factor, the role of shame and recommendations for therapists. And just a reminder, you can pre-order the ebook for All Together Us on Amazon. The book will be coming out in August. As soon as I find out when you can get the hard copy, I will let you know. You can follow me on all the things, IFS Tammy and The One Inside Facebook page. And you can buy my book, The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self, wherever you get books. Enjoy. I am so excited today to have Regina Way on the podcast. She is one of the authors of the All Together Us book project. And so I'm excited to have you here. Um, Let's start where we always start, which is if you were to look out your nearest window, what would you see and where you are in the world? Tell us where you are in the world as you do that. Yeah. um, So first of all, it's such an honor to be on this podcast. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I am in Bellingham, Washington, which is pretty close to the Canadian border, actually, almost as far north as we can get before going to Canada. It's pretty cool. Um, When I look out the window, it's, um, it was a little bit sunnier before it's been raining, um, but it's really beautiful. It's a little windy. And I see a maple in front of it's, there are buds just coming out. And then there's a pear tree where the blossoms are just starting to come in and a peach tree with pink blossoms. Um, and lots of Douglas firs. So it's really beautiful where I'm at. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. And isn't that, it's just such a beautiful time of the year when things are just starting to bud. You could really see, like, it's just, it's amazing that sort of like everything looks dead and there's like this little tiny, beautiful thing coming up out of the ground or up out of the trees. It's just pretty cool time of year. Um, Except for when there's pollen all over our cars and we start sneezing and that's not as fun. (laughs) Yeah, and um, the birds are going crazy at this time of year too. Yeah, it's really fun to watch them. Yes, and then listen to them. Like I have, I don't have my doors open now because it's still a little bit cool here in in New Hampshire. But um, the other day, I was I was like, man, the bird, I can hear the birds again. So it's amazing. It's been silent, and then all of a sudden, we can hear the birds. It's beautiful. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your chapter. Yeah, let, let's start there. Just tell me a little bit about your chapter. Mm-hmm. So the chapter is um, IFS and Asian clients. And um, it talks about the, it's geared towards clinicians who may be working with Asian clients, but also to it's for clients who may identify as Asian. And um, so the first thing I wanna say is that um, I'm very aware that I come from a very specific identity. I'm second generation Chinese American, So I was born and raised in Washington state. Um, And I recognize that I'm not speaking for all Asian clients. It's a very, very heterogeneous group. And it's really important to keep that in mind. And and actually that's one of the first points that I make that Mm. um, when working with Asian clients or Asian American clients, we need to really know where they're coming from, how they identify as Asian. Um, 
71% of Asian Americans, so again, I'm coming from an American or North American point of view, 71% of Asian Americans are first generation, which means that they're born in another country. So mm-hmm. that's very significant that um, a lot of clients are coming in with really rich cultural backgrounds that really inform how they move through the world and also how they relate to other people. So um, my observations are from my clinical experience working with Asian clients, but also from consulting with over a dozen colleagues, you know, to, to see if I can capture um, what we're seeing as clinicians. Um, and so I make several observations about that we can get into later about, you know, what to keep in mind and also what types of things come up when we're working with Asian clients. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I love that you made that distinction, but there's a part of me that's really curious about before we jump into that. Um, I know this is not your first go at writing. You have written a novel. So, um, you know, there, like I emailed you and I said, oh, there's parts of me that are just like, I would love to write a novel. And I remember, you know, I I never thought I would write a self-help book. I mean, I would have assumed I would have written a little novel or little short stories or something. And I remember in middle school having a binder and just writing stories. Just, I just love that. So tell me about your novel and what it's about and anything you want to share about your novel. Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, the one big caveat is that I'm I'm currently actively querying agents. So the novel's not published yet. I'm looking for someone to represent it. Um, okay, because... so any agents listening to this? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it has been a work that's, um, it's been, what, 14, 15 years in the making. Although the main bulk of the writing was in a five-year period. And at this point, I've worked it over so many times with a fine tooth comb that it is ready to go out into the world. Um, It is set in, it's based on my own personal experiences. It's not me. (laughs) A lot of me is in the novel, obviously, but it's based in China and um, it features two main characters. One is a Chinese American yoga teacher, young, mid twenties. And she's gone to Beijing to see if she can find herself, basically. She's searching for her identity. Um, She's kind of lost. And then the other main character whom she meets at the beginning of the novel is an older woman who lived through the Cultural Revolution in China and who actually herself was a Red Guard. And um, so they meet at the very beginning and their narratives are interwoven because even though they're really separated by culture and by generation, by so many different things, there are a lot of common themes to healing. And that's one of the major themes in the novel. It's all about healing, Um, healing from historical trauma, from intergenerational trauma. Um, There are definitely themes of uh, the effects of patriarchy um, on society and a lot of cross-cultural themes, cross-cultural connections. So not just between Chinese American culture, but also between Chinese and Mongolian culture. I lived in Mongolia for three years as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, And it's just like how people meet across all these different um, seemingly disparate, you know, places and also to how they miss each other. So that's the gist of the novel. Um, I can't wait to read it. I want to read it. I I love novels that that are about um, rediscovering yourself. Or um, I love that. And of course, I love novels about he, that. There sort of has a great story, but then there's this underlying like healing. And then at the same time, there's this beautiful like cultural backdrop to it too. That it sounds sounds beautiful. It's a pretty good book. <laughs> and I love that you feel that way. And I also love the parts of you that are ready to let it go, right? Let it ready to let it birth where it's sort of like you could sit there and play with it and re and edit it for like the next fif- do another 15 years of editing it. No, no, that's, that's yeah. I'm, I'm done with that. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. Good. So tell me about this. 
Um, you say most Asian cultures are characterized by deep rooted collectiv collectivism where families, elders, men, and people in positions of authority are accorded the most respect and privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me more about, about that, about why that's important or how that affects um, the Asian community and maybe how that's different than how that affects other other cultures. So, okay. So what came up again and again, as I was talking to colleagues, is the idea that family is so important for, um, what I mean by family is so important is that parents have a huge influence on children. And that means decisions that they make in terms of career, in terms of not exactly necessarily who they marry, unless, you know, in modern India, there's still a lot of arranged marriages. Um, but a lot of clients that I see, they are, they're torn between um, the more individualistic Western tendencies. Like if, for example, if they were born here or they grew up here in the States and their, you know, allegiance or respect for their parents. Um, so there's this tension that we see in a lot of clients. Uh, a lot of clients, it's like they really want to be, the word is filial piety. They really want to express filial piety and respect for their parents. But then sometimes it's like the parents are telling them that they need to go into certain professions or do certain things, have children, et cetera. Um, I mean, that's not specific to Asian culture, but it's definitely very important. Um, as opposed to what they actually want to do sometimes. So um, yeah, that's a that's a huge thing. One of the things I wonder if we can talk about the idea of the collectivism mm -hmm. and like what that means and how that collectivism is so deep rooted and I'm guessing like generational, like there's generational so that the like, you know, the, 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 the person that's sitting in front of you for therapy. And it's like, my mom, my mom and dad want me to have kids and they want me to pick these, these careers, but that's not what I want to do. Like I'm my own person. And here's my thoughts and feelings, but for their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, it was, they never probably even questioned it. Yeah. And so I wonder if even this person that's sitting in your office, if they feel like they're the first ones that even have questioned it, like, I, I wonder if sort of their parents weren't even allowed to question it. Yeah, primarily, it's just that tension between what clients want individually and what they're aware of, what their families expect of them. Um, one example of this is uh, a lot of Asian clients are expected, they their parents expect them to, and they expect themselves to take care of their parents. And so it's not even, not even thinkable for them not to. Um, and that's, uh, I have heard stories of, you know, um, non-Asian therapists being a little bit baffled by that. Right. Um, but it's such a part of the culture. It's like, no, of course you take care of your parents. That's what's expected. Um, and oftentimes, again, like kids will pick careers that are, are more um, what their parents want them to do rather than what they really want to do. So then there's that tension. Sometimes they go along that career. In fact, I provide a case study of this in the chapter where they, they actually go into medicine, law, engineering, you know, the professionals, uh, professions. Um, and then later on they find, you know what, this is really not for me. And I'm, I'm starting to face burnout because this is killing me. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, it's draining me. Mm -hmm. um, and then oftentimes they come into therapy. It's like, what do I do? There's this tension between what I know, what I need to do for my family um, and out of respect for my parents and what I really want to do. Yeah. So yeah. that's quite a dilemma. Yeah. And is it, um, <clears throat> and I'm guessing then we as therapists, then we get to help them get to know those different parts of them. Mm -hmm. um, and even uh, I'm kind of using my hands, like kind of like a polarization between those two parts. Um, but I'm, but I'm, what I'm feeling as you're saying that is that like my own opinions about that, I need to watch my own opinions about that. Like where I would be like, yeah, well, of course you need to do whatever you want to do and blah, 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 or whatever. Like, so I would have to really watch my, my own 
values around that maybe yes. and not kind of put that on to the client because and maybe because I don't know I don't know what right. their family loyalty values are right right being really careful about our own judgments about around that right or our yeah. opinions and that's the case with all of the work that we do with IFS right it's client led led by the client system and the therapist really should never be injecting her our judgments or values or something for projecting them onto clients, but even more so in, in cases like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and I feel like there's almost this small way we could do it where we're like, our parts can be more aligned with like certain parts of their, like, so I could have parts that are more aligned with their parts that are like, yeah, quit your job and go become mm-hmm. a yoga teacher. Like, yeah, I got have parts that are really aligned with that. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I need to be aware of that myself. Right, right. And really um, holding space for the tension, you know, the polarizations in our client systems, because ultimately they will figure out what is right for them. And what is right for one Asian American client is not going to be the same for another, right? So, but it's all, that's the case always with clients. Right, 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 right. What I'm hearing you say is, you know, that's true for all clients, um, but that we, you know, we need to have this understanding that in most Asian cultures, that's going to be a little more palliable or a little bit, there's going to be a little bit more intensity around, um, like you're saying, respecting elders and people, like people in that, that authority position, that that's a value in that culture more so in gen, again, in general, Mm -hmm. going to be more so than, um, in other cultures, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I would also add, um, so collectivism is like a double-edged sword. That was actually a phrase that a colleague used where on one hand, and I do talk about the protective factors for Asian clients in Asian culture, um, it's a double-edged sword in the sense that the collective or you know, one's family or one's tribe or clan provides security and safety and resources and support and love, right? All of that. And um, the individual is not as valued within the collective. What's valued is what is best for the collective. And usually it's the patriarch you know, in the family or the parents who are making those decisions as to what's best for everyone. Um, So it also can be a source of trauma, especially Mm -hmm. for those who don't have power within Asian cultures. So against, well, more specifically, people who are younger, um, people who are not male, so female-bodied or non-binary folks. Um, There's a whole, I mean, if we, when we talk about intersectionality, all the aspects of our identity um, that's the other thing we need to consider all of these aspects of our client's identity, which is again, what we would do with any client, but it's more pronounced maybe, um, if a therapist is, doesn't share the same cultural background as their client. Um, but yeah, it can be a source of trauma. And one thing that I'm thinking about specifically right now is, uh, clients who are socialized as female, who, um, have a really hard time speaking up. So using their voice. Um, And this is true even of clients who have been in the States or in the West for more than, you know, one or two generations. It's really deeply ingrained. So there's, there are a lot of things at play. There's respect for authority. So don't talk back to your parents. That's an absolute no. Um, But also to, you know, women and girls are not expected to, or not really not um, encouraged to speak up. And also to then there's that, again, these are huge generalizations. Everyone is, you know, we need to look at each client individually, but, um, you know, girls and women, as in patriarchal cultures, they're socialized to nurture and to always think about others and to care about others. But that's a huge burden that a lot of Asian women have. Um, so it's like all these layers of burdens, right? Yeah. Um, not only is, for example, an Asian woman beholden to the patriarchy, but also to like all the other men, like mm. all the men in the family, and has the 
um, the added responsibility to your job to like take care of everyone and make sure everyone's okay. Um, great harmony in the family, stuff like that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot. That is a lot. Do you find that be- that is such the norm though, that sometimes either you or um, your, you know, the, the, your family members or your clients that they don't even know that that's a burden because that's just the way it is. Oh no, there, I think people are aware. Okay. Um, they feel that or they know that they know it, they feel it, but it, the question is like, what do we do about it? Right. Because again, there's that tension um, of all these polarized parts, parts that really want to do what's right within the culture. And I say right in quotes. Yeah. Um, yeah good. Yeah. And um, what's, what's actually more, um, I don't want to say healthy, but what's more allows them to feel more free on a certain level. Well, I'm guessing there's the right, which we're putting in quotes, there's the right for the collective and the family, and mm-hmm. there's the right for me. Yeah. And uh, like, if that feels different, then yeah. there is that tension, like what's yeah. right for me, which is which right, right for the family. Yeah. And, and then sort of, especially if you feel like then you have to choose and how in the world do you choose that? Yeah. Oftentimes what happens is um, similar to code switching is um, what I have observed is people, <laughs> they act one way with their parents you know, respectfully and and all that. And then they're kind of, they lived different lives outside of their parents' yeah. Um, yeah. view. And that works. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a survival strategy. Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant strategy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I love that because it's sort of not, it doesn't feel like all or nothing. It feels like, okay, this is, this is, it's adaptable. This is how my system is adapting to the circumstances that I'm, that I'm in. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, um, there is the, there's still the tension there. I keep using that word, but there's still that tension there, right? Because a person doesn't feel fully themselves in certain situations. Um, Yeah, they're probably not fully themselves in either one, right? Because right. this one, because the again, polarized. So this right. one, let's say like I'm, you know, incredibly quiet, quiet over here. So then I almost have to be louder and more dramatic over here. Uh, not necessarily, um, but it's. So what I'm thinking about is another thing I talk about in the chapter, which is the fact that, again, we're talking about Asians in the West, right? living in racialized bodies. Um, and so it's like all these, these um, characteristics, are these are all facets of our identity. And so it's, as you say, it's like in one situation, we can't fully express all of who we are. And in the other situation, um, seen and treated as an Asian person within a predominantly white society, culturally, um, there are parts of clients that they need to hide or, you know, yeah, basically hide or assimilate in order to get along. And again, it's for survival, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is what you write about that. Um, Asian slash API folks. What does that mean? Um, Asian Pacific Island. Okay. That's what I thought, but I was like, okay. Yeah. Um, folks in the West live in racialized bodies and may experience invisibility, be the targets of hate crimes and racially motivated violence, experience microaggressions and subtle acts of exclusion and, or be exoticized. Yes. That's it. Objectified as sexual objects or emasculated. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, really, there's real. a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about that, that being really real. You said that's really real. Um, so, so one thing I write, um, and this is included in the intro to the intersectionality section in the book. Um, but one thing I write is that I suspect 
that there are a lot more similarities across the global majority cultures than there are differences in some important aspects. Obviously, there are differences, right? Yeah. Um, but basically, um, BIPOC folks going through um, um, society are racialized. So what does that mean? It means that the minute someone looks at someone who looks like me, they have already preconceptions about who I am, uh, how I'm going to respond to them. And, you know, they may project ideals or biases onto me. Um, I don't know how to go into this without, without going into a huge history of racism in the U.S., which is actually really important and relevant. Right. Okay. Yeah. But let me talk about one thing that's relevant to Asian clients, and that is um, the model minority myth, which was a, a narrative that was constructed by the media in the 1960s, especially when civil rights movement was really gaining steam. When um, there are actually there's a lot of collaboration between Asian Americans and black folks um, and the establishment who wanted to up hold white supremacy, basically, um, s did not like that. Because um, the idea is that, you know, if those who are oppressed um, come together and are united and then challenge the power structure, then that's not good for those in power, right? right. And so they created what's called the model minority myth. And, and at the time, it's just called model minority, but it's a myth. And the idea is that Asian Americans, and when they said Asian Americans, they meant East Asian. So specifically Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans um, at that time. Uh, the idea that um, Asians are hardworking, they're family oriented, they are more successful than other minorities. So this was the myth. And this was this narrative was created as an anti-Black narrative. It was specifically created to put down Black folks. And of course, what it ignored is the history of, of how people came to this country, right? Mm -hmm. And the history of racism and how people have been kept down institution, you know, on the institutional level, on the systemic level, where in, in entire or entire bodies of people have been oppressed and and ignores the selective immigration that allowed um, highly skilled professionals from East Asia to come to this country. So it was this, this narrative that was pitted, that pit Asian Americans against Blacks, against Latinx, you know, um, to keep everyone down, basically. And a lot of people bought into this myth, and people still do. For example, just recently, um, there are a lot of Asian Americans challenging affirmative action in education. Um, and this is kind of like uh, coming to a head at Harvard, for example. But then what people don't realize is that, you know, there's so many legacy kids, white kids at Harvard. It's like, again, it's the same thing. It's like if we can if we can pit all the minorities against each other, they're not going to challenge the power that's in place. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, for me personally, again, I, I write in this chapter, I write from my point of view. But um, so I grew up in the Seattle area. I was born and raised here. And it was very white at the time. Um, and basically, I was just expected to assimilate. Um, so when I was out in public, when I was in school, I really had to... Hmm, downplay my Chineseness. And so Ch Chinese culture is a, it's a very important part of my own identity. And I lived in China for three years um, and learned a lot um, about myself and about the culture. But when I was in school, and this is all the way actually through grad school, predominantly, everything was predominantly white. Um, I really had to, I knew how to get by Right. I knew how to act in a way that would be acceptable, that wouldn't um, scare people too much. That's that's my part saying <laughs> saying that. Um, but anyway, this goal goes back to what it's like to live in a racialized body. It affects us every single day. Um, 
There's a and part of me that is so curious about your personal story. And I don't know if you, if how, how comfortable you feel about this idea that like you, this part of you that had to make sure that you didn't scare people too much. Like, how scare would you my, feel? Again, that's a part. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> scares yeah. a little bit of exaggeration. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you want to say more about, well, do you want to say more about this idea of like what it was like for you? I mean, do you, you don't have to, if you don't feel comfortable, but just what it was like for you to be like, okay, I need to act this certain way when I'm in school. I don't have to act that way at home, but like me at school or me in these areas that are predominantly white, this is, this is what I have to kind of project out. Like these are the parts that have to drive the bus. And then these are the parts that have to get exiled. That's a huge topic. Let me think of how I can. Okay, so I can't remember if I share this in the chapter or not, but um, I talk about how I have parts that have a very visceral reaction to white folks. So I'm being really frank right now, right? Speaking for my parts. And in doing my own healing work around how I myself have been affected by racism, I realized that this part is like three years old, really, really young. And it came, it took on this burden when, um, so I'm second generation, which means that my parents, uh, they were born in China and then fled there as re refugees to Taiwan. Um, and then they came to the States in the sixties. So um, my mom's English is, was not very good. And she came as an adult. Right. And so when we went out in public, I noticed how people treated her um, condescending, dismissive. Um, and so this is actually kind of at the front of my mind right now. A lot of people very subtly are fearful of difference. And this is kind of baked into our, that's what racism is. It's fear of difference. Um, and not understanding, not understanding difference. And that's what I saw when, you know, in the grocery store out in public with my mom, I saw how white folks treated my mom. And again, her English was not very good. And I saw my mom's reaction. So again, I was a really young kid and this really, so she had parts to help her get through. Like she had parts that were really polite, really, really polite that were kind of um, cutesy, mm -hmm. um, that pretended to not understand, like kind of dumb. And by the way, my mom is a dragon woman at home. Like she is very powerful and ruled with a you know iron fist and, <laughs> and everything at home. So there's this disconnect between the mom I was seeing at home and the mom I saw in public. And in my really young mind, I was like, holy cow, you know, these people are, or this is how my mom, you know, acts with them. I must do that too. It's scary. Um, so there's a visceral mistrust. Um, a part of me has a visceral mistrust of white folks. And this was only reinforced as I went through school. Uh, again, where I grew up was very white. Um, and so all my teachers were basically white women. <laughs> I, I I don't remember many male teachers. So, you know, um, and it was very subtle. But again, because my system was already primed to be the hypervigilant parts are already looking for that. And um, then my other parts, you know, helped me assimilate. And what do I need to do to get by? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. How does it feel to share that? Does that feel okay? Yeah, it's um, it's a story that I've shared a few times. Um, I offered a, the workshop Healing from the Effects of Racism and IFS Exploration at the IFS conference a couple of years ago, and I shared this story there. I think it's really important. It's not easy. So you asked me what it, it's not easy, and I feel my part's coming up, and I'm I'm kind of being with my parts, right? Mm -hmm. But I also have really strong activist parts that are like, you know what? It's because of lack of understanding that people have fear. 
and they act out of ignorance, right? So it's really important to, this is only my story, but I suspect um, a lot of people probably can resonate with it. So it's important to share it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. I feel um, honored that you would be that vulnerable with me and with the listeners. And I think it is important. And, um, and I think we all like personal stories, (laughs) you know, it's just something feels more connecting about personal stories. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is why I say it's really important to share it. Yeah. 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 What about this? I'll shift into this other thing that you say, client systems may carry legacy burdens. This is what you were just talking about, really carry legacy burdens from intergenerational and historical trauma, as well as from the impact of Western colonialism in Asia. There's so much to say on this topic as well. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I feel like already like looking at my list, I'm like, we kind of covered, we like touched on all these things a tiny bit, even this, I'm like, okay, we touched on that. (laughs) This is why everyone's gonna have to read your chapter. Yeah, and even the chapter is not comprehensive by any means, right? Right, Um, yeah, they're all little just like touches, I think. Yeah, okay, let's talk about, so intergenerational trauma, which is oftentimes closely linked to historical trauma. Um, So my... I studied Chinese history and my own background is in Chinese uh, Chinese culture, right? Um, so many recent historical events, when I say recent, I say last 200 years or so, relatively recent, um, have happened that, um, you know, we're talking about wars, famines, uh, human created disasters, natural disasters, a lot of human created disasters. Um, all of these things have affected people, obviously. And so intergenerational traumas, have, and of course, just within uh, people's own cultures, if I, I'm just thinking like running through, I'm like Chinese culture, yep, Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese, you know, Indian, like all these different cultures um, have their own burdens. So that's what clients are coming in with. And, and it really depends on... <clears throat> um, how close they are to the immigration experience as well and how that experience was for the family. Like under what circumstances did they come to the West? Did they, for example, experience a lot of privilege and status in their home countries like my family did, even though they were refugees from China, but they were highly educated. And so they enjoyed a lot of privilege where they were. Um, And then they came to this country ostensibly with nothing in, you know, materially, but with a lot of cultural capital. So again, going back to the model minority myth, um, they had a lot of things that they could draw on when they came here. So that would be really different from um, a Vietnamese American, for example, whose parents were refugees who came literally with nothing and who came from wartime situations, right? right? So there's so the intergeneration historical are sometimes intertwined. And so clients come with a lot of trauma from those. and. If you think about it, like if parents were really stressed or grandparents were really stressed about survival, basic survival, then that stress is passed down to through all the generations. And I do see that in clients um, where sometimes there's an irrational um, anxiety around money or about material things or survival. And I was just thinking today, yeah, even hoarding, you know, things like that. Western colonialist um, trauma, created trauma. So again, um, I'm coming from a Chinese history standpoint where I'm thinking about, um, there's a lot of humiliation involved. So Western powers coming in. And so again, I'm speaking about China, but this happened with other countries as well in Southeast Asia, you know. Um, And then there's also like, uh, Japanese colonialism within Asia. They're, it's very complex. Um, but for example, in China, in the 19th century, uh, Western powers came knocking on China's doors and had superior technology and military force and literally forced China to open up. So there's a huge, um, the intellectuals at the time were like really just trying to figure out what do we do? Like, do we hang on to the you know the most how do we hang on to the most important aspects of Chinese traditional culture and thought 
and how do we adapt and how do we um, maintain our own dignity in the face of all these humiliations. And when I say humiliation, it's, you know, Western forces came in, they extracted resources um, and basically um, denigrated local cultures. Um, they're not valued. They're, it's very extractive, very exploitive, the mentality. Um, and China has thousands of years of history and a lot of cultural pride, which in modern day China, now you see a lot of nationalism. Um, they're very proud, right? And so how do you, how do you reconcile the two? Like being subjected or being, um, you know, I think they're even like, like people were felt like they're brought to their knees, like the country is brought to its knees. Um, a very proud civilization, right? So shame, there's a lot of shame, um, as well as a lot of destruction of traditional culture. So again, if I can use an example from my family history, my family was converted to Christianity. My grandparents were converted to Christianity on both sides. And on one hand, that was what helped them come to the States, their Christian and church connections. On the other hand, it's also um, made my family lose touch with certain aspects of traditional Chinese culture um, that I have actively sought out at this point. For example, um, ancestral reverence is a really, really important part of a lot of cultures, not just Asian cultures, but that was definitely lost in my family because of Christianity. Um, and that's something I'm actually, I'm actively um, exploring right now. It's been really powerful for me personally, because too, like I was born here, right? So I have these threads of connection to another culture and I even lived there for three years, but um, I, there's a certain part of me that feels unmoored in this country. Um, like I, that's another aspect of being in a racialized body. Like I never belong, right? I yeah. never belong here. And also too, when I went to China, I didn't feel like I belonged, right. um, even though right. I do speak Mandarin. So all of these are very complex things that Asian clients might be grappling with. Yeah. 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 Um, again, I appreciate you, you sharing that, um, the other thing that you say, which I think you've touched on this a little bit, um, but I would love to hear more about it. Clients' Asian heritage can be a protective factor that serves as a resource as well as a source of strength and resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about that. Heritage yeah. is some protect, protection, protectors that use heritage. To Absolutely. Help. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about cultures that have thousands of years of history and traditions. Um, and like I said earlier, the collectivism can be a double-edged sword. The positive aspect of it is, as I mentioned, um, the support, the feeling of community, the feeling of being part of a group. And we know that, you know, healing happens in community. And so that's partly... The dilemma I think that some Asian Americans have, which is searching for community. Um, for me, for example, here in Washington State, where I am currently, there there's not a Asian population. In Seattle, yes, but not not where I am currently. Um, so that's like a that's something that's kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, but being knowing that the family always has your back. Now. That is not always true, <laughs> but um, but usually families are supportive of you know their offspring um, <laughs> as long as the offspring do what they're told to do. <laughs> um, also, too, I mention um, well. Also, I would say to just having more than one. Uh, worldview to draw from mm. is really, really rich for me personally. So I am personally influenced by Dallas philosophy and Buddhist philosophy and having a, a cultural connection to that 
um, even though I was raised Christian, is really has been really, really important for me. And I also see it just in the way that it's hard to describe. Culture is transmitted through language, and it's also just through like family culture, right? How our family does things or how people are with each other. Um, so that can be a source of a protective factor for sure. And also to this, um, I want to be a little bit careful here because there are sometimes stereotypes about Asian people being spiritual. Um, there is some truth to that. And obviously not all Asians are very spiritual. Um, so I want to be careful around that. And it can be a protective factor. So um, for example, what I was talking about with um, ancestral reverence, connection to our ancestors, that can be a huge source of support and healing for those who are open to that. Um, and also just um, native Asian spirituality. So what I'm thinking about specifically is, you know, uh, Buddhism and Taoism and um, Japanese and Korean, like all different cultures have their native religions. I know that, for example, shamanism is really important in Korean culture. Um, having that to draw on is really, really important. Yeah. I was thinking that it, it, it potentially has this, this, like helping with the feeling of belonging or even um, the word holding is the word that keeps coming up for me. Like there's something about that, that has like a holding, mm -hmm. it holds me like sort of that, like connection to my yeah. spirituality or connection to, a, to such a rich, beautiful culture it feels like it's yeah. a holding. Yeah. It's complex. Like there's a part of me that's like, it's complex because it's not always beautiful. Yeah. Like, ex yeah. again, when we talk about legacy and cultural burdens, that's very real, yeah. right? So it's all in there. Like, our legacy, our cultural legacy is mixed. They're yeah. beautiful and really, really precious elements. And there is also a lot of trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what else um, feels like important to share for the listeners about um, working with Asian, um, populations or, um, if they're Asians, Americans or around the world, we have people listening from around the world that are listening that maybe don't have access to IFS, don't have access to therapists. Um, I know this is a huge question, but sort of what else do you feel like you want to share? That's a big question. I know it is a big question. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the idea of shame. So this came up again and again, again, when I was consulting with colleagues. Um, <laughs> I think one colleague even said something like, we do everything better, including shame. <laughs> that might be a paraphrase. The shame. So one thing I mentioned in the chapter is parenting oftentimes uses fear and shame to get people, to get kids to fall into line, basically. Um, but there's also, so shame is used as a parenting tool um very harshly and also there's a shame of like from colonialism the shame of being a different bodied person in western and you know culture so i talked about um emasculine emasculization, emasculation. Um, so if we look at the stereotypes of Asian Americans in Western media from, God, the, I don't know, 1920s on, or earlier probably, um, there are really harmful stereotypes about what Asian women are like. They're exoticized, they're objectified. Um, this also is related to the wars that happened in Southeast Asia. Um, where servicemen, troops, you know, all they knew about Asian women were prostitutes. So, and then they brought those ideas home. So in Western media, uh, Asian American women are exoticized and they're also seen as like the dragon lady. So scary. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm like, that's so silly. But anyway, and then with men, if you look at media, like Western media, Asian men are 
historically have always been very emasculate, like um, emasculated, like not as they're, they're shown as effeminate, as powerless, as um, silly or nerdy, not to be taken seriously. Um, and, and people do, to a certain extent, sometimes internalize these stereotypes. Yeah, so shame is a huge thing. And again, like I said, it has so many different levels within the own family, you know, as cultural burdens and as racialized people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, may, it makes so much sense to me that if you're in in a, in a world that that what what the world or the people around you tell you you are, whether that's invisible or sexualized or um, less than or minimized then parts of you have to believe that parts of you have to then internalize that and believe that, and then start telling you that about yourself as again, as a way to survive it, probably. Yeah. I would say that's more true of the, of emasculation. I keep, what the word, what is the word? I think emasculation is the word. You're emasculated. Yeah. Emasculation. (laughs) I think that's probably more true of, of emasculation, less so these days especially when I see a lot of very confident Asian American men, um, it's heartening. And to be very honest, so I grew up in the 80s and 90s, right? Um, And to be very honest, even though I did grow up in a Chinese American church, the very first time I saw an Asian man who was really confident was when I went visited Taiwan in college. Yeah, that's saying a lot. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, men in Taiwan are at the top of the, you know, hierarchy. And they, I was I was shocked. I was like 20 or whatever. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so different from the Asian American men and the and the first generation immigrant men that I had known. Mm. Mm. When when you talked about having different worldviews and it's good to have, you know, sort of different worldviews, I thought, yeah, because when we all have a worldview and we believe our world, we, we're, we're blended with our worldview. We believe our worldview is true and fact and we're right about it. So when we open up to different worldviews, then we can, we really can see that there's some truths and some not truths in both of them. Yes. Um, so that's, that's coming to my mind because it, of the, you know, you being able to see these distinctions and then it almost opened up for you, these two different ways of, that's not what you're exactly talking about, but that just reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, when we learn a language, we're learning the culture and mm-hmm. because things are not expressed the same way in each language. And so, um, when we learn languages, it opens up entire worlds. Mm-hmm. And then when we live in other cultures, it's like, wow, okay, then we have a frame of reference or we can compare, right? Basis yeah. for comparison. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I do have some recommendations for therapists specifically in the chapter and people can read that themselves. We've touched on some of this already, but it's like really being mindful of our own biases biases and stereotypes and preconceived notions of who our clients are if they're Asian or Asian American. Yeah. Um, noticing, for again, so this is what for a white body therapist, noticing any discomfort that comes up. And again, that discomfort, I believe, comes from a discomfort with difference and not knowing enough, not knowing much sometimes. Yeah. Um, I also say be aware of this fine line between expecting clients to educate you about their culture, right? And encouraging them to share their personal experience. But this is true of all cultures. Yeah. Um, just for therapists to be really mindful of their own parts as they're working. Um, wh- one thing that I find from my system that's really helpful is when I sense a, a certain level, I think humility actually should be a self quality. So a certain level of, and because humility is without agenda, right? Mm-hmm. Humility is a sort of openness. And it's like, I don't know, but I'm respectful. And when I sense that from people that I meet, white folks that I meet, then my system relaxes. And I'm like, okay, I don't have to be quite so protected and defended. My protectors can relax 
a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, I also talk about, and this is true not just for Asian clients, but working with, again, I'm speaking more to white body therapists, working with our own parts that hold racial trauma. So as I see it, racism as a system of oppression has affected everyone in society, and it's traumatic for everyone in different ways, but everyone has trauma around this. Mm. And it's really important for us to really compassionately hold those parts of us that have the biases, that hold shame. So again, white folks that have shame around being racist. When I say that, I know it's a little inflammatory or provocative. I say that, you know, people are racist because they grew up in a racist system. It's the water that we swim in, right? And yeah. so by definition, we're racist yeah. or white folks are racist. And I don't say that as a, um, I'm not trying to put white folks down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but to be curious about that. To be curious about it. And also, white folks, yeah. And in particular, to really, really recognize and work with the parts that hold shame, that hold guilt, especially if we misspeak or do something that causes harm. Um, defensive parts, that's a huge one. Um, and avoidant parts. Mm -hmm. So just being really, really aware of parts around racism. Um, and the more aware people are, the more open, the more self they have available for their clients. So it's super, super important. Um, yeah. And the last thing I say is, as with all clients, you know, approach the Asian clients with as much self-presence as possible. You know, curiosity, compassion, patience, playfulness, you know, humor, connection. Thank you for that. And I thank you for just showing just being who you are and just sharing so much of your story, you know, even with parts of you that are, are hesitant or reluctant or, um, I just appreciate the openness to be yeah, so, well, to be vulnerable. That's what it feels like. Well, thank you so much for creating and holding this space. It makes it easy. Good. Good. That's important for my parts. Like that's what I want it to be. I want it to be easy. I want it to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell me if okay so last question for fun last uh if if you were not doing what you're doing and you and you had to do something different what would you do oh without question I'd be writing fiction okay <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like you know I love I love writing um it's very intense it's a very solitary process and right now though I'm working on therapy <laughs> So I don't have time to write, even though I'm trying to get this book out into the world. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah, without question. Yeah. You be writing, writing fiction. I love it. I love it. But you're right. It's, it's different. Like you, you writing the novel is different than you trying to get it out in the world. It's like different energy or different. So um, it's sort of good. Now you're doing therapy and you're trying to get your book out. So um, I'm glad you wrote this chapter and I'm glad I get to know you because of this project and I appreciate you being on the episode today. Yeah, thank you so much, Tammy. It's been great talking with you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. You know, there's parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you, thanks for listening.